ओके सर गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द स्कूल ऑफ लैंग्वेज लिटरेचर एंड कल्चर स्टडीज आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस ऑनलाइन लेक्चर सीरीज टूडे वी हैव डॉक्टर राहुल पुंगलिया विथ आस is going to speak on marxism and literature today and again tomorrow this is a lecture series primarily meant for the post graduate students of the department of english and also research researchers who are pursuing research in english at the school of language literature and culture studies of swami ramananda tirth marathwada university nanded however this lecture series is through online mode so anybody can join this youtube channel and can have access to this link and video lecture any time even in future so i welcome you all rahul pungalia is a very renowned scholar he is teaching in the department of english at Abba Sahib Garware College. He has been teaching for more than three decades. He qualified NET while he was uh, a student, and he was awarded with JRF, which made him go to the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad, for research, where he spent two years and came back. And uh, after a long time, he could finish his PhD. For his PhD, he worked on new Marxian literary critics. He is a poet, and uh, of recent, his anthology of poems has been brought out by Oppo Coin Publishing Private Limited, New Delhi. And uh, he hopes to bring out a few more anthologies in the next few months or year or so. So I hope uh, uh, the students of the Department of English. and the wider community that is interested in marxism and literature would certainly enjoy his lectures and uh, uh, i wish him all the best for for these lectures and now hand over to rahul good evening to you all uh, today i'm going to talk about marxism and literature now the as the title itself suggests there are two parts of this uh lecture one is marxism and another is a literature so the and there unites marxism and literature as much as it divides marxism from literature so i'll have to talk about both the sides and talk about their mutual influences how marxism was influenced by literature and other way round before that but of course out of these two things though literature is more ancient than marxism older than marxism we are more interested in the influence of marxism on literature so these out of these two terms the priority goes to marxism as far as this particular uh, lecture uh, this particular set of lectures goes because you could have organized it we could have organized in other way round and we could have called it literature and marxism and in that kind of a setup we would have given priority to literature and how you know it has absorbed or dealt with marxism okay and i mean you know because literature in itself has a kind of uh, its own epistemological status its own existence and its own way of knowing the world just as marxism is a philosophy of existence philosophy of knowledge a uh, social science a method in social science and the social science itself and economics a historical view marxism is many things so in that sense literature also is 
no lesser than Marxism, one has to realize this. Now, what is Marxism? If you are familiar with European history, then you would realize that Marxism is, in a way, a kind of enlightenment philosophy, which is at the same time a critique of enlightenment. So it shares with enlightenment certain common things such as humanism, such as insistence on democracy and freedom, and so on and so forth. Uh, not all the uh, aims, not all the aims of French Revolution, but at least some of them, because the whole French Revolution was a bourgeois revolution. So whether Marxism is a philosophy of equality and fraternity, one has to find out. But Marxism is certainly a philosophy of freedom or a theory of freedom, human freedom. And it is Enlightenment philosophy, because in Enlightenment, that is 17th and 18th century Europe, Europe, due to many historical, socio-economic reasons, as well as intellectual reasons, became suddenly a different kind of thing than what it was for centuries. It became, a, what would we say, a modern society. Modernity erupted in Europe. And Europe became a weak, a very violent and aggressive vehicle of that modernity to the entire world through the processes of imperialism and colonization europe transferred its modernity to far away countries such as china india very remote corners of africa and what is known as latin america so europe was a kind of a modern society to begin with. Now, what did this modernity entail? What was this modernity? And Marxism in that sense is a philosophy of modernity, as well as it is a critique of modernity. Modernity meant to begin with a certain a uh, skeptical way of looking at the world, the nature, uh, a kind of revolt against tradition, religion, debunking of the faiths which were old, and a very kind of, you know, conscious living, a living which was at always aware of itself, it was always guided by rationality, reason. And this was one kind of rationality. And this was basically scientific, technological rationality. Several philosophers from Descartes and Leibniz onwards to the British empiricists such as Locke, Berkeley and Hume, and German philosophers such as Kant have had tried to uh, formulate the principles of this rationality. But this rationality, of course, obviously did not begin with philosophers. It was not the philosophers who gave rationality to the society. They only documented that rationality and reflected upon it and tried to show what that rationality entailed. There were, if before modernity, in the pre-modern world, there was not a great attempt to know the world in a very radical, fundamental way. Because the world was accepted more or less as given. And one's own place in that world was also given. The society was fixed and the nature around that society was also fixed. And nature and society were more or less seamlessly joined. 
what happens with enlightenment and what happens with modernity is there are tremendous divisions between nature and society between individual and society between human reason and human body and all these divisions allow the human reason to reflect upon the entire world and there are various people various uh, schools of philosophy who try to formulate this uh, ways of dealing with the world ways of knowing the world in different ways there were broadly two different ways of understanding man's relation with nature and man's relation with the world one was that human mind is a passive recipient of experience that human mind takes the world as it is given to it the objects in the world are the causes of human perception and human mind is a tabula rasa or an empty tablet which accepts that experience and then through some very simple processes such as association and observation of regularities tries to find some clue in uh, the obvious anarchy of experiences and tries to put it to certain order so mind is a passive recipient of experience and the objective world human being is part of the objective world is subject to the laws and regulations of that objective world is subject to the cause and effect relationship of that objective world and in fact the knowledge is also part of that cause and effect process like for example there is a light which falls on the object and then it falls on your retina and your brain processes that light and you understand what that object is so this is a kind of crudely even today most of the people's understanding of how knowledge takes place or how scientific way of understanding the world is there was another way of explaining the same activity same interaction between man and the world and in that way the mind was not passive but the mind was an active agent which shaped the experiences so human mind or human subject understood the world in its own way it was a kind of you know this is in a way a kind of perhaps one can say an idealist uh, way of understanding uh, the world but uh, it of course agreed with empiricists that the material world exists and it gives us certain sensations but the act of cognition and the act of you know shaping the world in our mind happens with human agency human beings are not passive beings they have got understanding they've got categories of understanding the whole kind of you know uh, you know uh, the whole uh, uh, conceptual apparatus that is erected does not come from nature obviously how can it come from nature that was the question asked by these idealists because they uh, looked at hume uh, who was a skeptic and who said that you know all that you see in the world is incessant uh incessant flow of sensations so how do you know that it is the same object that you see how do you have the idea of sameness oneness it is not there in the world all that you have is sensations how do you know that event a which always precedes event b is the cause of event b it may be just an accidental uh uh happening again and again it may be just a coincidence how do you know that x is cause of y because all that you see is succession you do not see the cause and effect so the idea of cause and effect must be coming from your mind i mean hume did not come to this conclusion 
but the idealist philosophy especially the german idealist philosophy under the leadership of kant came from this uh, came to this conclusion now why am i talking about kant and hume and you know the ways of understanding the world because normally we understand marx in a kind of you know positivist scientific way we feel that marx believes in the materiality so much that he leaves no room for human agency in fact that is so far from truth because it was marx who belonged to this entire kind of german idealist uh, tradition he was a german himself influenced by hegel so much so that you know at one time he said that you know when people were there were criticism there was lots of criticism of hegel he said that you know people may think that hegel dead dog but here yeah. i am last disciple yeah. of hegel so the idea uh, was marx uh, excuse me has somebody kept his mic on please unmute the mic so uh here the idea was i mean you know if you look at the central concepts of marxian economics then you what you would find at the heart of marxian economics is labor theory of value that the value to a commodity value to an object is given to it by human labor the world in itself does not have a value a tree or soil land does not have any value whatsoever it is human labor which transforms that arid land that land which is just a fallow land into a farm and the farmer grows by the dint of his labor on that farm a beautiful yield crops the grains and the wealth is created so it is human labor which creates the wealth furniture is created by man nature does not give to create this value and this is very close labor theory of value is very close to kantian understanding that it is human perception human mind the a priori you know what kant called the human subject and this human subject with all the uh, a priori uh, synthetic a priori categories and analytic a priori categories uh, this human mind can make sense of the world which is otherwise senseless the world is chaos without human ordering of that world into a meaningful whole into a kind of you know so that idea of time and space does not exist in the world does not is not there in nature there is no time in world it is human mind which gives the notion of temporality so all history is basically human history all space is basically a human space and this was in a way a birth of humanism and marx in that sense is a humanist and that's why he inherits this uh, kind of you know enlightenment modernity through his humanism also marx is critical of enlightenment i'll come to that later but first thing that we will have to establish is that there is a great deal of impact of german idealism on otherwise uh, materialist marx materialist in quotes okay so uh, the copernican revolution that was executed by marx that was executed by kant where the objective knowledge was transferred into a different kind of objectivity which was determined by the subject which was determined these two terms are very important to understand marx today we are going to talk about philosophy of marx and economics of marx 
and then only when we understand it we will deal with the effect of marxism influences of marxism on literature now i'll take a small kind of a break from this particular flow of argument and i'll tell you you know what i'm going to do today when we deal with a topic such as marxism and literature we are dealing with two kinds of things here one is you know how marxism as philosophy as a social phenomenon as a kind of you know an organizational and uh, political movement as a kind of you know critique of capitalism how did it influence literature so where do you see you know the ideas of marx reflected in various authors whether as coincidences whether as direct kind of you know effects or whether you know as paradigms of thought which can emerge simultaneously at different places though their kafka may have never heard of marx or never never may have studied marx if you can show that there is marxist uh, perception of alienation in kafka then you can say that you know yes you can use marxism to understand kafka or perhaps kafka new marxism or perhaps marxism is proven to be true by uh, what kafka is writing or what kamu is writing what dostoevsky is writing what tolstoy is writing so you can you know or you can say that you know yes if you believe that you know marxism has got a greater kind of you know uh, monopoly over truth then you can say yes dostoevsky kafka tolstoy etc are proven to be correct because marx said it so so either way so the direct connection between direct or indirect connection between marxism and literature this is one way of understanding this topic marxism and literature another way of understanding the topic marxism and literature is what is the marxist school of criticism of literature is what are the marxist theories of literature now this is a very specialized kind of a branch there is certainly if you take a survey of various academic institutions you certainly can classify certain critics as marxist critics so from lenin's and trotsky's first essays on literature to uh george lukash adorno walter benjamin uh, raymond williams terry galton frederick jameson ejaz zamat and so on so forth you have in marathi you know harish uh, sharachandra muktibodh so you have got several critics who call themselves marxists dk bedekar and there were there are several others so and all these have different theories about literature so within them there is not one marxist theory of literature but there are marxist theories of literature so for example you know your Euro, uh, european marxist theories of literature are different french theories uh, marxist theories of literature are different than what theories were popular in soviet union under the kind of uh, helm of stalin and zhadnov which uh, kind of you know uh, talked about very primitive kind of uh, mimetic or realistic theory of literature that literature is a uh, mirror of society whereas the french and german and british theories of literature were more nuanced and they did not uh, say that literature is a uh, reflection of society as much as it is a refraction of society i mean reflection and refraction are two terms from physics so in refraction there is some kind of an illusion that is created there is no direct mirroring of reality 
So what you have is you have got two different, you know, uh, uh, schools of thought. And uh, even among European Marxists, Althusserian way of understanding literature, uh, especially by his disciples uh, called Pierre Machery, his understanding of literature is different than what Raymond Williams is doing, Terry Galton is doing in Britain, what Frederick Jameson is doing, what Adorno was doing, what Lukash is doing, what Brecht, Bertolt Brecht is doing. So you've got, you know, all these, I mean, all these are important names, uh, Bertolt Brecht, George Lukash, Walter Benjamin, Theodore Adorno, uh, Williams, and Eagleton, and so on and so forth. So literary criticism, Marxist literary criticism is one thing, and Marxist Marxism and literature, or the influence of Marxism on literature is another thing. And for that, I mean, I'll go to Marxist theories of literature, little later in this set of lectures, because first I will have to prepare the ground for that. I'll have to talk about what is Marxism and what is literature. And only then can I go to influence of one on the other. Right. So what you have now to go back to what I was saying is the German idealist theory, which did accept the existence of the world outside, which was not in that sense completely idealist, and because that is a caricature of any idealism or materialism. No materialism is possible without acceptance of mind or human agency or human subjectivity in some way or other. And I mean, no idealism is completely devoid of the objectivity of the world. So but the stress on either of these poles uh, is more or less depending upon whether it is idealism or materialism. So the German uh, uh, idealist philosophy, which was uh, Marx's inheritance in a way through Hegel, through Fischer, Schilling, Hegel, and critique of Hegel by Feuerbach was something which uh, emphasized human agency and also human freedom. Because what happens with extreme materialism is, mechanical materialism is, that human beings are not given any freedom whatsoever. They are uh, chained to the cause and effect relationship. They become part of the physical material world. So you start explaining your emotions. I mean, just as, for example, you know, people in Maharashtra are very uh, familiar with a uh, movement called uh, uh, Andashraddha Nirmulan or eradication of superstition. So there, those kind of people, that variety of people, start explaining everything from a physicalist point of view. They start explaining everything from chemical or electrical or neurological uh, kind of processes in human body. So you're, and this is a great loss of human freedom. Whereas Marx was a strong advocate of human freedom and he, his entire kind of, you know, philosophy, his entire kind of, you know, analysis, criticism of capitalism, because modernity, I mean, you know, I'll just come to that. Modernity is in a way coterminous with and uh, almost synonymous with capitalism, because the modernity that we have is the capitalist modernity. So Marxist criticism of capitalism was based on showing that human beings under the uh, rule of capitalism are enslaved to being just physical beings. They've lost their freedom, okay? So here freedom is a very important kind of a concept to understand Marx and his uh, labor theory of value.
you know because in economics also this gets reflected that the value according to classical economics and neo classical economics uh, is uh, rests in either land or capital but ma it was marx who pointed it out that value that is created i was had given you examples of the chair i mean you can't sit like monkeys on branches of trees you have to convert those branches and cut those branches and turn them into chairs so that you can sit down and listen to a lecture or give a lecture like the one that we are doing now so the idea is that this uh labor theory of value is in that sense assertion of human agency the human effort human work as against the strong kind of scientist or empiricist positivist bias of classical economists which said that it is land itself which creates wealth if there is a fertile land then it in itself is wealth whereas marx does not think that any nature he calls nature the inorganic body of man and man has to create the human world out of that nature so nature in itself is not wealth money in itself machines in it themselves are not wealth capital in itself industry is not wealth if that nobody is working in that industry then it will be a wasteland it will not be wealth nothing will come out of it so one has to realize marxist very close connection with uh, german idealist philosophy and one can go in detail there but we do not have time and uh, requisite expertise also to go into that but one has to realize that this is an area that has to be needs to be explored it is so under explored today because marxist philosophy has become a uh, and marxist theory marxist sociology marxist economics has become too scientist too positivist and empiricist uh, one has to stress then endlessly the anthropocentrism of marx in view where human beings occupy the center stage at the same time marx was a dialectician what does that mean marx believed in the kind of you know made him aware of objectiveness but this objective necessity was not a scientific objective necessity as much as a historical necessity so human beings create the world and that world in turn operates upon them it is human world which creates the human being and it is the human being which creates the human world nature in itself cannot create this it is a conscious effort etc we'll go into that later okay uh also the scientific truth is universal whereas for marx the truth is historical and whatever is historical cannot be universal what is true today certainly was not true in the 17th century implications of this are tremendous what is true here may not be true somewhere else in the world whereas the scientific truth any chemical equation or any economic theory or sociological theory is applied randomly everywhere and hoping that it will click hoping that you know it will be true everywhere but marxist objectivism 
I mean, he was a committed objectivist as well as a committed subjectivist because he was a dialectician. He insisted upon how a kind of, you know, it is human context. I mean, all truth is contextual. That does not make it relative, but one, one cannot overlook the historical context of the truth, the particularity of the truth. This is very important because literature also has a particular or specific truth. Literature is different than science because it is not universal. Literature is very, very, very local. It is rooted in a particular language, in particular ethos, in particular mind, and so on and so forth. The exper experience of literature is the experience of thisness or quiddity or specificity. And that is why appropriating Marxism for literature seems to me a viable project. Because unlike the extreme idealism or extreme materialism, Marx negates the uni universal uh, truth. And that is why. Marx differentiates between different stages of human history. There is a pre-modern, I mean, you know, the first division is between pre-modern and modern history. The modern history, which begins somewhere in the 17th, 18th century with the development of physical sciences, technology, industrialization, capitalism, and imperialism. And all these terms are very important. All these things are equally important. So human uh, mo modern history, which begins with kind of, you know, revolt against church, uh, formation of Royal Society of Science, small workshops where manufacturing takes place and those manufacturing workshops slowly turn into industry, accumulation of capital, which needs to be invested in industry, development of technology, use of steam and uh, the finding of coal to produce that steam and imperialism to uh, find uh, raw material for immense uh, onslaught of production that is going to take place as well as the possible markets for the finished goods and so on and so forth. So this period modern period, modern capitalism is distinguished by Marx and the truth of this period is different than pre-modern period or feudal period. Again, Marx makes further Right. Uh, I thought, you know, I got disconnected for a while. I think I'm back again. Right. So uh, the pre-modern societies were divided by Marx between feudalism, before that a certain slavery in Rome and Greece. In Greece, the slaves were called helots, the Roman slavery, plebeians and patricians, you know, the two classes. And before that, certain primitive communism, which he was uh, made to think by Rousseau, because Rousseau thought that perhaps there was a time when no human being enslaved another human being, and the whole land, whole earth, all the resources, water and sky, everything was everybody's common kind of, you know, share. 
there was no private property so he distinguishes this uh, kind of you know uh, history according to different periods and uh, this is very important for us to know because you know we students of literature have to study literature from different periods and one cannot carry over themes from the modern period to pre modern periods so the notion of equality and notions of identity and fraternity and democracy etc gender equality caste and class equality we try to project from our modern period to the pre modern periods and there obviously the consciousness is very different so if there is a possibility of certain kind of marxist hermeneutics then using the using the uh, uh, jargon of hermeneutics one can say that the horizon of understanding of pre modern periods is so different than modern periods and one can not easily apply one set of categories from here to there also marx distinguishes between european societies the tribal societies in uh, africa and latin america and the asiatic societies in india and china and so he has talked about an asiatic mode of production so just as there is feudal mode of production in europe there is asiatic mode of production where you know the political changes rarely affect the ground level reality empires come and go sometimes it is mughal sometimes it is you know uh, different kind of kings from different dynasties but the village system hardly witnesses any changes also the center and periphery the societies which are at the center of capitalist development and societies which are peripheral to it where primitive accumulation takes place marx does not talk when I mean, he initiate he has initiated talking about it when he analyzes imperialism but it was later dealt with by uh, late other marxist scholars so the issue of the whole issue of imperialism and everywhere you would have different kinds of social relations different kinds of production methods and different kinds of you know conceptual apparatus so the universality of knowledge which is there in scientific understanding is not there in marx marx is very specific marx is very particular and he uh, understands the uh, world that's why much better than many other people now uh, what is the difference between modernity and pre modern society this is very important for us to know because we have to study simultaneously the literature of say chaucer uh tragedies of sophocles aeschylus and euripides as well as ts eliot's westland or isra pound's cantos or hart crane's bridge now hart crane's bridge is about an iron bridge which is a kind of you know epitome of modern industrialized america westland is about the urban industrial capitalist london whereas euripides and aeschylus and sophocles world is in small greek polis polis p o l i s is a greek city state so you have different ways of understanding these different literatures you can't have the same kind of you know ideas of justice same ideas of beauty same ideas of human relationships same ideas of man's relation with nature when you read these different texts from different periods also when you read indian texts 
as compared to European texts or African texts or Chinese texts, again, your understanding will have to be more nuanced and more differentiated. You can't, you know, have the same kind of, you know, application. Now, in the pre-modern feudal society, the relations between human beings, the exploiters and exploited classes were very different than they are in the modern society. In modern societies, the social relations are voluntary and free. So even if a worker is forced to work because of his hunger, because he is so poor, he is free to choose to work or can freely choose to starve to death. He is free to choose this master or that master. He is free to migrate to a place where he will get better wages and so on and so forth. Whereas in feudal societies, it was the freedom was completely absent. The tradition, the caste, the social, legal customs and hierarchies defined the relations of production, defined how production goes on. So you have, you do not have a kind of, you know, naked exploitation as it is there in the capitalist society, in the older societies. In older societies, there is loyalty, there is certain responsibility that the uh, owner of the forces of production has towards the uh, workers who work for him or her. Now, let me, you know, take this opportunity to tell you what, how Marxist uh, economic analysis works here. I mean, you know, at least few concepts from that. I refer to forces of production and relations of production. Marx makes a very kind of, you know, a great kind of uh, conceptual, uh, you know, uh, distinction between the two. Relations of production are something that determine the social formation or economic formation of the society. So relations of production may be between a capitalist and his workers, an industrialist and people working in his factory, or a multinational corporation and the uh, small companies which uh, do job work or peace work for that multinational corporation. So there can be a contract labor, which is not directly employed by multi multinational corporation, which works for it. Or you can have relation of production where, you know, the uh, landlord has bonded labor on his land or what was called serfs, ACRFs in Europe. So you can have different relations for production. Whereas the forces of production are the technology, the human labor, natural resources, capital or absence of that capital. These are the forces of production. So forces of production are the more objective aspect of, I mean, you know, Everywhere, you know, there are these two poles, subject and object. Relations of production are the subjective or social subjective aspects of the production. Whereas the forces of production are more independent material conditions of production. And these two relations of production plus forces of production define the mode of production such as Asiatic mode of production, feudal mode of production, capitalist mode of production, post-capitalist mode of production or globalization or neoliberalism, all these are names of modes of production. 
like for example with globalization and new uh, liberal economic mode of production what you have is great uh, technological development in communication technology and information technology which we are using for this lecture i mean this lecture would have been impossible in the hey days of capitalism so only in kind of post capitalist societies only in you know globalized societies this kind of also similarly the pandemic like corona would have been impossible in a capitalist society you needed globalization for corona to come and for corona to be understood and corona to be dealt with and corona to be experienced i mean without these you know means of communication of communication and information technology we would have dealt with corona or similar pandemic in complete so corona is in a way product of globalization and product of the uh, new liberal uh, you know uh, post capitalist kind of a society one has to try to corona is not only a natural phenomenon there is nothing natural in the world nothing purely natural in the world everything is shaped in us by the society by the culture by the stage at which the mode of production is one has to realize this because this is the marxist method so uh, the modern mode of production of course marx did not live to see the uh, the apogee of imperialism or post imperialism or new imperialism he was he was alive only when capitalism but he could foresee a little in future uh, he could see only capitalism and he in a way though he is a great critique of capitalism he is also he also welcomes capitalism because for him capitalism is a progress over feudalism because capitalism breaks asunder the legal religio legal or legal religious hierarchies the social hierarchies and it kind of you know Uh, establishes a kind of an equality among human beings as wage laborers all human beings are wage laborers and possible owners uh, possible owners of properties so everybody one man one vote political equality of course he criticizes this kind of equality he criticizes the equality given by the state given by the kind of you know which is not there really in society so it is an unequal society which is covered by equal state so but still this was better because at least legally and politically everybody is free of course everybody is free to sell his or her labor he calls it universal prostitution so for him a modern worker is the metaphor that he uses for modern worker is prostitute you can prostitute your faculties like for example a lecturer in college allows the college to use his vocal cords and his uh, parts of his brain the knowledge a worker in a factory allows his hands and legs and the strength to be used and a prostitute will allow her gen uh, her organs of reproduction to be used so this is a kind of you know where human beings are made to use their physical faculties as means of survival but 
this is better than what he considers to be a very kind of stupid kind of society and he uses this word stupid he considers feudal societies to be stupid societies so in that sense marx is a progressivist who believes in human progress those who do not have that inclination those who do not think that human beings are progressing can criticize marx here i mean marx as i told you is a product of enlightenment and product of modernity though he is also a critic of modernity so he has taken certain you know values of modernity modernity entire modernity believes in human progress i myself for example do not believe that human beings are progressing because what i see is that we are heading towards a complete annihilation by our depredation of nature environment and very horrible system of production called the present capitalist system so i feel that you know we have hardly progressed but you know everybody will have his or her own view marx believes in uh progress and he believes that you know human beings legally and technically free though not actually free is a step ahead than feudal relationships so in certain sense marx is though he is critical of positivism he is also kind of you know uh, he was a great student of physical sciences of his times so when it i mean you know the stories go that when he found himself to be ill or sick that incapable he was incapable of working on economics or philosophy which were his chosen areas of work so in his illness and sickness as a way of resting he used to study physics and chemistry and mathematics Uh, of course only marx can do such a thing we will find it i mean you know at least people who are uh, committed art student will find it not a rest but for the exertion so uh, i mean you know i'm just introducing to you what marx is and you know uh, to understand marxist uh, relation marxist relation with literature one has to liberate marxism from scientist and positivist view otherwise literature cannot be explained because if you consider marxist philosophy philosophy to be science then you will have to create a science of literature which is a well nigh impossibility which is a paradox because literature is basically occult mysterious in a way and in the last analysis something that you cannot understand and here i will you know take help of marx himself marx was in love with the greek and roman tragedies and greek and roman literature and he was quite surprised about this because he said that those societies were such primitive societies so how could they have primitive societies i mean you know if you are a progressivist then you should believe that there should be progress in literature also as newton is better than ptolemy alexander pope who was contemporary of newton should be better than aeschylus or sophocles who were contemporaries of ptolemy if there is progress in physics and astronomy from ptolemian uh geocentric kind of world to galilean heliocentric world there should be progress in literature also but literature does not progress and that's why but marx was himself puzzled by this and he said perhaps that the early periods of mankind 
were purer and more innocent periods of humanity. And that is why we like, just as we like our childhood, all human beings like our childhood, because in our childhood we think that we were innocent. Of course, with Sigmund Freud, this notion of childhood innocence is, uh, is rather uh, kind of questioned. Anyway, just as you know, of course, Marx did not know much about Freud. So, uh, just as you know, human beings like their childhood so that, you know, we like the childhood of our society and the literature and art of that society. That was Marx's answer, which is not really very convincing. But as it is, we have to concentrate. If we want to make use of some Marx, then we will have to concentrate on his non-scientific, non-positivist aspects, where he is advocating human agency, where he is talking about, you know, uh, the essence of man, and so on, so forth. So, because otherwise, you know, we will subjugate literature to another extrinsic method of study, rather than, you know, capturing the soul and essence of literature. So, similarly, to understand religion, I mean, you know, it is uh, spread, the particular lines of Marx are spread, that religion is opium of the people. But the whole context of Marx's analysis of religions, and he has analyzed, has talked about religion in different ways, you know. So only one line that religion is opium of the masses. And if you are a Marxist, then you have to be an atheist. Because there is something very common between literature and religion. One has to understand the commonalities between the issues of faith and issues of literature. So one has to understand, and also the notions of freedom that are there in religion and, I mean, the true spirituality. Not, of course, in the kind of, you know, religious fundamentalism or religious bigotry that you see all over the world today, but in the true spirituality, if you want to understand religion and literature, then you will have to have different kind of marks. Okay. Now, I uh, go to uh, some basics of Marxism. And as I told you, Marx was not just an economist. Marx was not a, just a philosopher. Marx was not just a sociologist. Marx was not just, you know, a culture critic. But Marx was everything. I mean, Marxism is in that sense, you know, Marxism breaks the boundaries between different disciplines. All said and done, the Marxist economics is very important because it is a very viable, very valid kind of, you know, critique of capitalism. One has to realize that Marx is in a way a product of capitalism and Marxism will survive as long as capitalism will survive. I mean, of course, it is not other way around. One has to realize that. It is capitalism which comes first, and Marxism as a critique of capitalism comes later. So Marxism is not going to, in a way, Marxism is dependent upon capitalism as a critique of capitalism. If you have got different non-Marxist and non-capitalist ways of production, then perhaps both Marxism and capitalism will be uh, as conceptual frameworks will be unnecessary. So when you want to understand Marxism, one major thing that you have to understand is 
how the capitalism works and how marx's interpretation of capitalism or critique of capitalism and marx was a great student of capitalism so in my next you know 15 20 minutes i'm going to talk about marxist economics because only then do you will you understand uh how marx understands the human society to work which we can help use later to understand literature which was produced in those societies right uh i'm not going to go i'm not an economist i am a student of literature so i'm not going to go in depth because there are lots of you know debates about also within marxist economics and debates of marxist economics with the mainstream economics of the academy so i'm not going to go into it's not going to be a very uh, comprehensive and sophisticated analysis of marxist uh, economics it is just you know few concepts which i find useful as a student of literature i'm going to deal with so in a marxist theory as i told you in marxist economics is uh, deeply resonant to the social and historical issues unlike the uh, academic economics so for academic economics laws of supply and demand are eternal demands the rules of say uh, you know uh, marginal utility etc are kind of rules which are you know constant to all societies whereas marxist economics is very sensitive to the historical stages of society marxist economic theory talks about capitalism as a mode of production which produces commodities so instead of use values it produces exchange values and it also produces use values but commodities are exchanged for their price not for their uses and they are exchanged to people or exchanged between people who may not need them so if you are thirsty but you do not have monetary power purchasing power to buy a glass of water then you will not get water whereas a person who has got purchasing power to buy a bottle of water even though that person is not thirsty can buy it and will buy it and will store it so that in future when or he or she will get thirsty he can drink it so this is kind of commodity this is not i mean you know all objects everything that is produced by man or woman is for use like houses are there for staying and uh, your footballs are there for playing and books are there for reading etc etc so the use of that product is defines its social value whereas in capitalist society that is not what happens in capitalist society it is the exchange value of that society where commodities are compared with each other they determine the values of those commodities so here a kind of you know commodities are exchanged for each other through the medium of money when there was barter system before capitalism things were exchanged for the use values in villages the carpenters work whereas an iron smiths work a farmers work was exchanged for their to satisfy their respective needs whereas in a society which produces commodities 
the products are acquired their own equalities so for example you know one book is equivalent to say 10 pens or two dishes or one lunch and so on and so forth so commodities start acquiring an independent existence this is very close to sozure's understanding of language where the signifiers the words mean only in relation to each other rather than to they they have a value in relation to each other what they can be exchanged with rather than their signification or their reference so just as you know there is within a language words create a kind of a close network in the same way in a market commodities create a close network now a commodity is a product of labor but here that labor gets stored in a commodity and it is forgotten that it is the labor which has which has created that wealth where and the commodities themselves start duplicating themselves this is a kind of you know fetishization of commodity commodity becomes independent of the labor which has created it so one has to understand this in a capitalist society i mean you know the classical uh, economists talked about two spheres one was sphere of production and another was sphere of circulation and it was assumed that the profit takes place or profit is born in the sphere of circulation that is you buy cheap and sell dear the difference between your purchasing price and the selling price is the reason for profit marx shifted attention from sphere of circulation to sphere of production and he pointed it out that the it is the sphere of production which creates profit and the difference between the wages given to the laborer and the value or the laboring hours that were put in the product of labor this difference creates a surplus value or the profit so this is very important i mean you know i mean here and you have a kind of you know birth of capitalist ideology or capitalist illusion and we will have will find that very useful when we talk about literature that when you are producing something you are taking things you are giving wages to labor for the survival of the laborer so the laborer is you know his means of living are given to him in terms of wages whether he works for 8 hours or 10 hours or within 8 hours he produces you know 20 goods or 200 goods it doesn't matter whatever he is going to require to live to survive in the case of say for example software engineers it is comfortable survival in the case of you know a wage laborer on the street it is not so comfortable survival it is just uh, you know hand to mouth kind of survival but in both the cases what you get paid for is for your survival and not for the value that you have produced the the value for which the product is going to be exchanged so a uh, for example a person working in a shoe factory 
may produce 10 shoes in a day, which will be exchanged for, say, 5,000 rupees, but his or her daily wages would be just 1,000 rupees per day. So the rest, remaining 4,000, is the surplus value or the profit. Now, this profit, the and as I told you that, you know, these shoes are exchanged for their prices or exchange value and not for their use value. The use value is completely, you know, thrown outside. Now, this is, this was a great insight of Marx that, you know, he uh, showed that surplus value is created in the sphere of production rather than sphere of circulation. And this is how you understand the important uh, concepts which are necessary to understand the modern literature, where there is a great distaste for work, great dislike for industrial work. And you get that as experience communicated in several literary uh, works. Now, because the work is so exploitative, the laborer finds it to be onerous. Laborer finds it to be a burden. Laborer hates the work. So one has to kind of, you know, understand this. And an illusory world is created, that of commodity exchange, which sits on top of the actual world where things are used by real people. So you have two worlds. One is the world, the real world, where knowledge is produced and knowledge is consumed, where shoes are produced and shoes are used for walking and running, where food is produced and food is, food is eaten. So this is the real world, which is completely hidden by the commodity market, by the market in which things are exchanged for the prices. So this kind of, you know, false world that is created is the ideological world, is the world, world of market and all the laws which support that market. The laws that are created by the state, by the constitutions of different countries, the social norms, the ideas of prestige associated with the uses of things, and so on and so forth, uh, is, is the false world. Now here, one uses this kind of, you know, uh, one can use Marxist insight to understand the writer's effort to cut through or to show the experience of this false world of commodities, false world of market. And the kind of, you know, then this world will become a spectral world, world of ghosts, world of imaginary things. And that's why in the 19th century and 20th century literature, you meet many ghosts. You meet many supernatural things. It is a world of dead people. So the entire idea of zombies or vampires or Dracula, which are sucking on the blood of the people. And here the people, by people, one obviously means workers. And the vampires may be easily interpreted as the exploiters, the capitalists. But even their world is not the real world. It is a ghostly world. It is a world which does not have any blood, any life in it. They have to continuously borrow that blood, borrow that life from the workers. 
so the whole kind of you know violence of living the whole reduction of living to the physical existence that you see in literature can be explained by these basic marxist insight into the birth of surplus value and exploitation of workers uh now for capitalism to happen there has to be capital and in feudal world there was no capital marx talks about the beginning of capitalism and he talks about the phenomenon called primitive accumulation what is primitive accumulation it is very illegal immoral predatory violent kind of encounter with other people where they are robbed now this entire kind of you know phenomenon happens in the context of colonialism and imperialism whether it is internal colonialism and imperialism or external colonialism for example in britain before it started slave trade and before it started you know uh, importing slaves from africa to and exporting them to uh, south of, to americas both the americas there was something called white slavery so there was a law against vagrancy any vagabond could be arrested by the police and was made to work for free for the capitalists so also in england because of the uh, with the help of fencing of the estates feudal estates where the serfs the tenants were made homeless and expropriated were driven to cities and then they became cheap laborers in the cities so this is a process of primitive accumulation now this creates concentration of wealth in few hands which is aided by agricultural technology and the dependency of people on agriculture is reduced and the erstwhile agricultural laborers are driven to cities to work in factories which are kind of hell holes or black holes described by william blake now if you look at what is happening around us in india today and this is not happening only in the context of the recent farm laws but it but it is happening for last 70 80 years in india we have the similar process of expropriation of the land owners farmers turning them into free laborers in the city free workers in the city so the whole process of urbanization and a kind of degradation of agriculture and also the change in the ownership of agriculture land from small landlords to big landlords to corporations is a process of primitive accumulation which sometimes is legal and sometimes it is illegal sometimes it is in the context of colonization with the brute force people are made to produce certain agricultural products such as for example indigo and cotton in india were forced upon us by the british settlers and which made land infertile and which fed the cotton industry at manchester so with the help of force or with the help of law a primitive accumulation takes place now if you want to study 
as students of English literature, the kind of colonial uh, economy, colonial literature, literature produced about colonization, then Marxist insights will be useful. As I told you, you know, today I'm going to talk a little less about Marxist critical theories, literary theories. I've reserved tomorrow for that. And today I'm going to tell you about how Marxism can be useful about studying various literatures. Now, uh, this expropriation and primitive accumulation is a continuous process, according to certain Marxists. So, so you know, people under the intellectual leadership of Emmanuel Wallace Stein and uh, uh, Günther Frank, etc., us dividing, they have divided the world into center and periphery. And the third world countries or the south of the world is the periphery and the north of the earth is the center. So this kind of forced state of undevelopment is becomes perennial for the global south because primitive accumulation goes on. And the capitalist center, that is Europe and America, Canada, etc., Japan, they continuously uh, try to keep us in different ways uh, undeveloped. They may use cultural and, so for example, you know, they will promote the religious rivalry, religious bigotry in third world countries. They may destabilize those countries. They may create civil war-like situation in the third world countries. So one can understand in the context of globalization, this continuous uh, kind of, you know, idea of primitive accumulation. But having said all this, for Marx, the mechanism of capitalism is not this kind of violent subjugation of certain kinds of people. But it was the entire circuit of capital where the workers worked for wages and capitalists owned the industries and the capital. And the this entire production was production of commodities production of exchange values rather than use values. So this was for him the central thesis of capitalism. So the circuit of capital where inorganic labor or the past or dead labor becomes the capital and machinery and it exploits the present or organic or living labor. So this was the kind of, you know, uh, way he, you know, talked about so machines and factories, which are products of the past labor. I mean, machines are not produced by the capitalists or industries are not produced by the capitalists. They are produced by the workers themselves, but they are it is called inorganic labor. So when organic labor out of necessity has to work in service of inorganic labor, everything is labor, capital is labor, but it is stored labor. Then a surplus value is created. Further Marx, I mean, you know, one has to understand this very carefully. So here there is a classic case of man versus machine, or this is a site of alienation of labor. I mean, your own labor is staring you in face and making you work. Like, for example, a teacher, for example, has to, if the teacher is forced to teach, as in, for example, private classes, then teacher will start hating the 
knowledge itself which he himself has produced or people like him have produced teacher will start hating the books in the same way worker who produces on the machine starts hating the machines because his own labor is staring him into face has gone against him so this is what you know marx is basically talking about and then he also tells you about the tendency of capitalism to always end in recession because there is extraction of surplus value the workers purchasing power is reduced continuously and there is always a glut of commodities which nobody can buy because there is a general impoverishment among the society as there is general impoverishment in the society the capitalism always finds itself in crisis marx explains this as the ratio of organic to inorganic capital so the when inorganic capital is more than the organic capital then you have recession when you have more organic capital you have got more profit and you got less organic capital like for example you know more automation is there more technologically enriched the industry less laborers you can exploit and that's why the profit is less and then there is a cycle of a kind of you know recession and more and more recession so this kind of you know creates continuous crisis in a capitalist society and capitalist society has to create ways out of this crisis by continuous advancement of technology so it's like you know running in the same place so that you can you know stay there you have to continuously you know the speed of change in your production systems is so much that you get confused you get you know completely disoriented because continuously you have to encounter new methods of production also it creates social unrest it creates wars and civil wars i mean and this is not at all false because 20th century the last century and last 20 years of this century have witnessed more violence ever compared to the entire history of mankind so there is these are we are living in very violent times so if there is violence in literature that can be understood by reference to marxist theory why literature is so violent and early literature was so sedate and so tranquil and calm because the conditions of life themselves uh, have become extremely violent so there is purposeful destruction of wealth there is pillaging continuous pillaging of nature denuding of nature there is continuous you know different ways of you know uh, destroying or reducing the undeveloped societies less developed societies and so on so forth so creation of great economic inequality is in the nature of capitalism so this is kind of you know uh, one has to understand you know this is how kind of you know capitalism works and tomorrow i'm going to i'll be talking about the phenomenon of estrangement or alienation and then i will deal with a few marxist uh, thinkers who have talked about the ideological sphere because this is where literature and culture belongs and various ways in which you know they have talked about the world uh, the ideological or the cultural world i'll be dealing with uh, just wait a minute 
I'll be dealing with you know uh, the classical Marxist idea of false consciousness, the Gramscian idea of hegemony, Althusserian idea of interpolation, Adorno's idea of instrumental reason, and Lukács's idea of verification. So these major Marxist literary Marxist philosophers or literary critics will be dealing with tomorrow. So now. Uh, if there are any, so tomorrow my lecture in the first part I'll be talking about alienation or Marxist concept of estrangement, which he talks about in his early work called Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts. So I'll be dealing with that because that is very important to understand modern literature, modernist literature. If you want to understand Dostoevsky and Kafka, you cannot escape understanding of concept of alienation in Hegel and Marx. They are pivotal to that understanding. So uh, we will be beginning with that and then I'll be dealing with some Marxist literary criticism per se. Okay. So if there are any questions, please come forth. Uh, I've finished my brief for today. Thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, or if you want to discuss some issues that I touched upon rather hastily today, there can be discussed too. Rahul, uh, this is a YouTube uh, live. So these yes. uh, participants cannot ask questions. They cannot speak. Yes. We are uh, on a different platform. So they can write their questions or comments in the comment box and Prakash will read out uh, that to you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. His thought means who's thought. Has anybody asked any question, Prakash? Yeah, sir. There are some questions. Let me read. Somebody said that, can you elaborate his thought regarding Marxist ideology? I mean, no. I... I GB shows, I think. Yeah. Rahul. GB shows uh, thoughts in Marxist ideology. I think uh, Rahul sir left the. Yeah. Yeah, no, he has left perhaps by mistake. No. Hope that he no, joins thought... soon. Now I think you know I've uh, entered again. Yeah. Sorry, my machine, my tab was not working, so I've entered again. Yeah. Right. There is there is question Rahul by Milan Bedshe. Uh, hello. Please go ahead. Rahul, uh, Please Rahul, go ahead. Am I audible? To you? Yes, you are. But you are not visible. Am I not visible? Yeah, you are visible, but uh, not so clear. It's camera problem. Oh, I sorry, think. my it's camera is not really good. This one is with this instrument. But can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very clearly. OK. There is a question Please not ahead. based on. There is a question which is not based on your presentation, but uh, you can uh, respond to this or you may respond to this tomorrow. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, how do you look at uh, Shaw receiving marks? How do I uh, look at? George Bernard Shaw receiving Karl Marx. Oh, yeah, I, I do not. I will have to uh, postpone it to uh, tomorrow because, you know, I am not 
much of a Shaw fan. I've not, you know, I mean, Shaw's Fabianism I've heard of and, you know, uh, Webb uh, family, uh, Sidney Webb and his wife, they, uh, and Shaw was a Fabian that I know. And, but Shaw's interpretation of uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, Marx, I'm not much familiar with. Because I never, you know, took Shaw much seriously. I mean, he was a, he's a good entertainer. But of course, you know, uh, he may have had some... I mean, it was it is a typical elitism kind of, you know, literary elitism that I also share with, that I have. And that's why, you know, I did not read Shaw very seriously. So, you know, either tomorrow or perhaps, you know, some others, you can ask this question to somebody else. If somebody else has got that knowledge, I mean, you know, the question is front of me, how wealth accumulates and main decay. Okay, says that man's ignorance has been increased in an industrial area. So uh, I, if you want me to commit, uh, commun uh, comment about that, yes, then I will comment about that. Yes, man's ignorance has increased in industrial area, uh, era, especially because of the division of labor that Marx talks about. So earlier, a craftsman used to produce everything right from cutting down a tree to producing the furniture the whole work was done by a carpenter but today a person working in a, a factory and i mean this is true about early industrialization this is more true about late industrial capitalism uh, today so person working in a factory because of division of labor and because the machine assisted labor, the whole intelligence, whole, the whole skill and craft was transferred to the machine. And all that a human being had to do was tedious, repetitive jobs, uh, which kind of, you know, took away uh, the creative enjoyment of the work, the meaning of work, all those things had were taken away. So this is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, this is the result of industrialization. When uh, machines or factories produce things, then human beings do lose their agency in different way. So this is, but this is without reading Shaw. I'm answering this from a typical Marxist kind of point of view. Is there anything else? Uh, Marxist ideology, but whose who's thought regarding Marxist ideology? I think it is the same Shaw. He's asking about no, George Bernard. No, I don't Bernard. know much about Shaw. As I told you, you know, I confess that I'm ignorant about George Bernard Shaw. I mean, more, more ignorant than I'm about Marx. I'm ignorant about Marx too, but, you know, more ignorant about Shaw. <laughs> Okay, fine, sir. Uh, there is no question left. Right. Okay, so thank you. So we hopefully look forward for one more uh, exciting session tomorrow ahead. So uh, uh, see you again at the same time tomorrow. So I yes. thank all the participants. Uh, who listen to Rahul and this lecture will be available on YouTube so you can have access to it anytime and it, you can inform your friends to uh, have access to it anytime. So uh, thanks to all. Uh, good night. Now uh, this session is over. Thank you. Thank you.